the president's remarks at the 30th anniversary celebrating the founding of the Tennessee Valley Authority from the Chemical Engineering Building at Muscle Shoals, Alabama, May 18, 1963. Mr. Chairman, Governor Wallace, members of the Alabama delegation, old friends and colleagues, Senator Hill, you, Senator Sparkman, Congressman Bob Jones, Congressman Albert Raines, Congressman Carl Elliott, all of whom have come from Washington today to take part in this ceremony. Alabama has one of the most distinguished delegations in the Congress of the United States. And I'm proud to be in a state. And I'm proud to be in a state that this outstanding group of men represents. Ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in joining you on a most important anniversary for this community, this state, this region, this country. Thirty years ago today, a dream came true. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the presence of TVA's two great defenders, George Norris of Nebraska and Lister Hill of Alabama, signed his name to one of the most unique legislative accomplishments in the history of the United States. That simple ceremony, which took only a few minutes, ended a struggle which had gone on for a decade. It gave life to a measure which had been vetoed twice by two preceding presidents, Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. And in reality, this act of signature was only a beginning. There were many who still regarded the undertaking with doubt, some with scorn, some without hostility. Some said it couldn't be done, some said it shouldn't be done, some said it wouldn't be done, but today, 30 years later, it has been done. They predicted the government was too inefficient to help electrify the valley, but TVA, by any objective test, is not only the largest, but one of the best managed power systems in the United States. They predicted, and there are always those who predict everything against something new, they predicted that a federal regional corporation would undermine the state governments and the local governments. But state and local governments are thriving in this valley. And hundreds of state and local park and recreational areas have been set aside through the entire TVA. They predicted that TVA would destroy private enterprise. But this valley has never bloomed like it does today, and hundreds and thousands of jobs have been created because of the work that these men did before us. New forests have been built, new farms have been developed. Engineers who testified that multi-purpose dams would not work, that rivers could not be developed for navigation and the generation of electricity and prevention of floods at the same time were proved wrong. Barge traffic on this system has grown from 33 million tons in 1933 to 2 billion tons today on a river spanned by more than 30 dams. They are contributing to the life and vigor of the largest supplier of power in the United States. And as the people of this state and valley who made this possible, I congratulate you all because this has not been made to work in Washington. It's been made to work by the people of the Valley. Despite a record of success, 
TVA still has its skeptics and its critics. There are still those who call it creeping socialism. And then we recently saw an advertising campaign which implied that TVA and public power were comparable to the Berlin Wall and the East Berlin police as threats to our freedom. But the tremendous economic growth of this region, its private industry, its private income, make it clear to all that TVA is a fitting answer to socialism, and it is not creeping, nor will it in the future. Hello and good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar tonight, which we are calling It's the Productive Economy, Stupid. And uh, basically, uh, the focus of our webinar tonight is to talk about how important and how significant it will be for our country to make that pivot from having so much of our resources invested in intangible items, such as uh, derivatives and other financial in instruments, and moving those resources over to producing tangible items like uh, dams and the infrastructure that JFK talked about in that stirring speech. Um, my name is Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm a business person from the Pacific Northwest and chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. I'd like to welcome a, a great list of speakers for tonight. I think you'll find it very educational and enlightening. And I want to thank all of our speakers for taking time out of their schedule to be here on this Friday evening. So um, first of all, I want to announce a special guest appearance via video from uh, Congressman Thomas Swazi from New York, who is a co-sponsor of HR 3339. And uh, we appreciate his co-sponsorship and creating this video for us. So let's let Congressman Swazi uh, have a few words. Hey, this is Congressman Tom Swazi. I'm glad to join my friends who are gathering together in support of Danny Davis's bill to create a national infrastructure bank here in the United States of America, of which I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. Uh, why do we need a national infrastructure bank? Uh, it's about access to capital at an affordable rate for important projects that have regional significance that uh, often cross state lines. Uh, it's really modeled after ideas from two great New Yorkers, Alexander Hamilton and Franklin Roosevelt. Alexander Hamilton had the idea that we should take uh, treasury bonds uh, that people have, and instead of just uh, taking a normal treasury bond, invest that money in a national infrastructure bank for a little bit of a higher return. But still, the rate of return that you'll have to pay as a municipality or as a private borrower will be lower than they would be with normal municipal bonds. Uh, in addition, it will focus on big, significant projects, uh, as Franklin Roosevelt had as part of the New Deal when working on uh, massive public works projects here in the United States. Infrastructure is an important part of the future of our country. We need to step it up. We've got this great bipartisan infrastructure bill that I helped to negotiate as part of the Problem Solvers Caucus, 29 Democrats and 29 Republicans. We laid out the framework for that bill down in Maryland. Uh, with the Problem Solvers Caucus, our, our colleagues in the Senate, as well as the Democratic and Republican governors to find some common ground. Now we need to encourage the idea of an infrastructure bank uh, that will take uh, uh, U.S. Treasury bonds and then leverage that into uh, five or ten times as much in borrowing that could be made accessible and available uh, to municipalities and others trying to build massive infrastructure projects. So I hope you'll uh, work together with us to try and encourage infrastructure and do so with the help of a National Infrastructure Bank. Thanks so much. Thanks to Congressman Swazi. Uh, here we have a list of our speakers for this evening. Um, and uh, some of them you may have seen before, but uh, we really appreciate their expertise and knowledge. And with that, we are going to go to our first speaker, Alfeka Mutardi, who is a macroeconomist who spent many years with the IMF. Uh, Alfeka? Thank you very much and uh, welcome to all of you this evening on tonight's uh, talk about the economy and how we can lend into it. So I'd like to start by uh, 
uh, giving a, a little bit of an update on where we are with the economy uh, because it's uh, it's uh, slipping into a bit of a recession. And I want to uh, give you all an update on this. Um, we've called our talk, uh, the, it's the productive economy, stupid. And that's because uh, we are possibly slipping into a recession. And we want to have a policy that will really work to improve our economy and make uh, it better better for all working Americans. So um, we, we all know that we've had really bad inflation lately. Uh, it's, it's going up and up. It's now 9% and it's not going down. Housing prices are spiking. Uh, gas uh, was very high. It's moderated a little bit, um, but it's still quite high. Interest rates are very high and something called the yield curve which is the difference between short and long-term interest rates, when that calculation goes negative, it indicates that we're slipping into a recession. The Atlanta Fed uh, has said that uh, their models show that the economy contracted in the first and second quarters. Uh, that's a model, it's not the final data yet, but uh, it indicates a recession. And then of course we know that the Fed has announced it's really going to fight hard against inflation. That means that it'll uh, lower the money supply, contract it down and raise interest rates. And that will uh, probably intensify uh, the direction of heading into a recession. We have a, light, a tight labor market. This is the first time we've ever entered into a recession with such a tight labor market. But still, there's a large chunk of the population, even though they're working, they're really hurting. Uh, maybe 20 to 40% of our population is housing insecure, going back to food banks, not earning enough to make ends meet. And so we want to work to ameliorate all of these economic conditions. And we have a great policy solution to do that. So what is our policy solution? It is a bill in Congress, uh, HR 3339. And what it would do would be to create a $5 trillion public bank, the purpose of which is to lend for infrastructure that the Congressman Swazi has talked about. Uh, we currently have, the update is that we have 13 co-sponsors on this bill. We're actively looking for more. We've added a whole lot of co-sponsors recently when everyone realized who supported the bipartisan infrastructure law, that it was a great start, but it was not large enough to do everything. And when the dust settled, uh, then legislators were speaking to their members of Congress and urging them to uh, sign on to this National Infrastructure Bank proposal. So how does it work really quickly for those who are new to our call? Uh, the, um, the, the bill is going to finance the $5 trillion in projects that uh, where we need new money as uh, calculated by the American Society of Civil Engineers to repair our transportation, water systems, electric power grid. We also want to build high-speed rail that'll, that'll really forcibly push up our economy, make sure broadband gets into every single corner of America. We want affordable housing for those people that are really stretched, whose budgets are really stretched for those particular class of folks that really are housing insecure, and some large-scale water projects to address drought in the country where we grow half of our nation's food supply. How does this bank work? It is the Hamiltonian model that, uh, that the congressman talked about. Uh, it is, uh, it, instead of going to the private sector and asking for money to start the bank, uh, instead of going to the, the budget, we go to the private sector, ask them what they'd like to sell in their treasuries in exchange for preferred stock that'll capitalize the bank. And then the bank will go on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank does, however, only for infrastructure projects and the loans would go to state and local governments who own public infrastructure. So that's uh, essentially it in a nutshell. If you wanna know more information about how this bank works, you can go on to our website, nibcoalition.com. So now I wanna say something about uh, what this bank does in a nuts and bolts fashion to address our financial crisis and rebuild our real economy. First of all, it is large. It is lending $5 trillion for infrastructure projects. It is only lending into the real sector, not for financial instruments. It's lending to fix roads, bridges, water, rail, infrastructure, affordable housing, all of those things that our uh, economy needs to uh, uh, grease the wheels to make the economy go, uh, move and go. Uh, the borrowers would be these state and local governments. What they would do is they would come in, 
take a loan contract from the NIB, and then they would contract out the work to the private sector builders and manufacturing firms that would actually do the work. Here's a picture of what this looks like in the real world, putting in new uh, lead, uh, replacing lead service lines in streets. That needs a lot of equipment. It needs a lot of workers, copper piping to put uh, all that in. That stimulates all that uh, stimulates our economy. And now instead of doing just a little bit of lead line replacement, we're going to do all of it through the National Infrastructure Bank. The large scale of the projects will create millions of families sustaining jobs. All of this leans against any new recession and stimulates the economy in a productive way uh, to build out our uh, economic uh, prowess. It will also lower inflation, improve the supply chains through the Buy America provision that the inputs must be made in America. All of this will hugely accelerate economic growth. It is a passable bill. There are no requirements for new federal taxes, deficits, uh, deficit spending, uh, increasing taxes. All of this should appeal to both Republicans and Democrats, and it's large enough to get infrastructure projects into every single corner of America. Not only will it grow the economy, but it will grow the economy equitably. Uh, the large scale of the investment will create Sorry, these family sustaining also. jobs, uh, it requires that workers get paid Davis-Bacon wages. It builds equitable infrastructure. That is, a lot of uh, uh, black and brown communities uh, don't have access to roads, they, they, uh, safe roads and bridges. They have um, um, it, uh, questionable drinking water in their areas. They don't have broadband. They don't have good transportation. We'll work on all of these things. Plus, the work that the, uh, the that these companies will do to build infrastructure, minorities and women-owned businesses will have fair access to these jobs. Uh, we'll have a targeted uh, project share going into uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods for disadvantaged businesses, making sure that all geographic areas get the infrastructure that they need. And, it, and if they're a very low income area, we might have a trust fund, we will have a trust fund in the bank to provide them with grants rather than loans. We're going to build affordable housing, we're going to link it to public transportation. This is the best plan for equitable economic growth that is part of the Biden administration's um, uh, push to make sure that we grow our economy well. So thank you very much for uh, your, your, your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alfeca. Our next speaker has shown great leadership and vision out west in his home state of New Mexico. Uh, so I would like to introduce Senator Bill Tallman uh, from the New Mexico State Senate. Senator, you've got the floor. Okay, okay good evening, everyone. Very glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me to share a, a few thoughts. Uh, I, uh, the uh, Moderator said that indicated that I was a lifelong resident of uh, New Mexico. Actually, I was born and raised in upstate New York and have since lived in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Texas, Illinois, and Ohio, and have lived in New Mexico less time than any other state senator. So very glad to be here. Uh, this is a very important subject with me spent a lot of time on this issue. And, you know, for, for many years, uh, America's infrastructure was the envy of the world, but no longer. Um, you know, if you go overseas and come back to America, go, it, it feels like a, a, third, a third world country because our, our road, one third of our roads are in poor condition. Uh, nearly a quarter of our nation's uh, bridges are, rated as uh, functionally uh, obsolete. Um, one, <clears throat> our American uh, Society of Civil Engineers um, has given us a grade of uh, D plus uh, several years ago, although recently they raised it up to a C minus. Um, anyone who's been through our airports uh, recently uh, knows that uh, our Airports are bursting at the seams and there are too many uh, non-weather related delays and cancellations. Uh, 
our trains. We don't have any uh, high-speed trains. Europe's got 25,000 miles of high-speed trains, but we have zero. Uh, if we can't move goods and, and people faster, we're not going to be competitive uh, worldwide. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, in 1920, trains uh, could average could go 70 miles an hour between New York and New York, uh, between Chicago and New York City. They don't travel any faster than that 100 years later. So we're really uh, deficient in, in that area. And transit, you know, we have, uh, most of our people are not able to, uh, to travel uh, through public transit, whereas uh, Europe and China, a much higher percentage of people are able to uh, tr uh, transport themselves uh, through public uh, transit. So here in New Mexico, we, uh, the bill that uh, Biden, President Biden signed in uh, late November of last year uh, falls far short of what we need. It's only a trillion dollars. Actually, half of that was all just a reor reauthorization of previous uh, appropriations. Um, just to give you an example, um, our state engineer says we need $2 billion for, for water infrastructure. We only got 350 million, which is one sixth of what we need, no money. Uh, to bring um, water from states with a surplus of water. We're in a extreme drought here in New Mexico, and we have uh, we've, our, our forest fires have attracted national um, national uh, news, and um, we, we there's uh, no money for uh, desalinization and no money to uh, repair. Uh, our uh, lead pipes. So, in other words, it's just a trickle of funding, no pun intended. It does not begin to uh, address our water issues. Uh, also, broadband. We got 25% of our population that does not have access to broadband. Uh, we figure it's going to cost $2 billion provided for everybody, and we're only getting $100 million, 1 20th of what we need. Uh, no money for high-speed rail. I've seen maps that show that the first line, first high-speed line to be built between the Mississippi River and California would go through New Mexico um, because the most heavily traveled interstate from the uh, Mississippi River to uh, California passes through uh, through New Mexico. And the electric get, grid, where uh, we were the second sunniest state in the country and we're in the top five windiest. So we have the potential of producing a lot of, uh, a lot of renewable energy. Uh, companies are spending literally billions and billions of dollars on, uh, on wind and uh, solar. But there is literally no money for our electric grid. We're fast approaching the point where we won't be able to transmit any more power. And roads and bridges. That's about the only area that we receive the efficient amount of money. 73% of every dollar we're getting from the Biden infrastructure bill is going for roads and bridges. You could make a good argument that that's not our highest priority, but I've been told by people who are very familiar with, the, with Congress that the auto industry and the highway contractors had a lot of influence on why that percentage is so high in New Mexico. So- Excuse me, Senator Tallman. Um, we just have a couple minutes left, but could you discuss the resolution um, that you have coming up here at the uh, conference? Yes. Uh, just one more point before I move on. China spends 8% of their GNP on infrastructure. Europe spends 5% and the United States spends 2.5%, just half of what uh, what Europe spends. Yeah, I have a, a resolution uh, before the uh, National um, Council of State Legislatures will be holding their uh, annual conference in early August in, the, in, um, in uh, Denver, Colorado. We, uh, it's, it, it, the uh, resolution simply urges uh, Congress uh, to pass a House uh, Resolution 3339, which has already been explained um, very eloquently 
uh, by an earlier speaker. And um, we uh, are very uh, optimistic that we're going to get uh, get that through. And I certainly, if that gets through, uh, gets uh, approved by the the uh, National uh, Council of State Legislature, will certainly have a significant impact on um, on Congress, since obviously it's uh, an organization that represents uh, all of the state uh, legislatures uh, uh, th throughout the uh, country. So we're very happy with that. We've also, as already been mentioned, we have 14 Congress uh, persons who have already signed on to, to this bill. And um, we, uh, two of our three uh, Congress persons from New Mexico have signed on, on to that. And um, over the last year and a half, I've uh, also made presentations before the Council of State Governments and have uh, authored uh, op-ed pieces in the state's largest uh, uh, newspaper and have uh, made other many other public appearances. So we urge uh, everyone to contact their Congress uh, person to uh, urge them to uh, support and approve and uh, lend their uh, arguments and in, 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 uh, and just mo strongly motivate uh, the passage of HB or HR 339. It's such an important issue. You know, infrastructure has, from an economic standpoint, has a has a big has a multiplier effect. Retail, and we spend almost 20% of our GMP on health. Well, health doesn't have much of a no multiplier effect, and retail doesn't either. But manufacturing and infrastructure. Have multiplier effect. It, it's it's just has such a much greater money spent on infrastructure and manufacturing has such a great impact on our economy. So much more than retail and uh, health. Uh, we spend far too much money on health and, and don't. Well, that's a whole other story. So uh, again, uh, thanks uh, for listening. Um, I'm very very. Uh, strong advocate of this of this program. And um, again, I urge your, you to contact your congressman to to support this very, very important issue that will stimulate our economy, uh, which is in decline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Tom, and we really appreciate you being here and your remarks this evening. Uh, next, uh, we would like to go to the Edward Cornell Professor of Law and Finance from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Please welcome esteemed Professor Robert Hockett. Thanks, Julie, Professor and, and thank, thanks everybody who's um, who's tuning in uh, this evening. It's great to be with you guys again. Uh, this is turning out to be a lovely um, and very, uh, I think, helpful series. Um, so I think maybe the best thing I can do this evening, and I've kind of been requested to do this uh, too, uh, is to help sort of contextualize a little bit uh, about the specific bill that we're talking about and uh, and the specific issues that we're talking about in connection with that bill in order to um, enable everybody maybe to get a better feel for the sort of historical importance of what's being proposed here and the sense in which what's being proposed here is a kind of return to American roots rather than some sort of radical, crazy-eyed, wild-eyed, uh, newfangled uh, set of ideas. Um, so, you know, the, the founders of the United States as a country, as distinguished from a, a group of, of colonies, uh, had a particular vision, right? The vision was to establish what they called a great commercial republic, uh, and that was to be understood in distinction from a set of colonies. As a set of colonies, all that we were expected to do by the mother country uh, was to produce raw materials and unfinished goods, right? Send beaver pelts and wood and, and foodstuffs and cotton and things like that over to the mother country, and then the mother country would do all the manufacturing, all the making. Um, and so the idea then was to keep us in a position of a kind of of dependence, right, forever. We were just to provide the raw materials to another country that was to do all the producing and to be the productive commercial society. That was, of course, Great Britain. The founders understood once they broke away that the only way to keep this country from sort of slipping back into a kind of de facto colonial status in everything but name or everything but sort of legal uh, status was essentially to establish the makings of an independent freestanding 
great commercial republic. And what that meant in turn was that it was going to be a society of productive people, a society of producers, a republic of producers. Um, and they understood, and especially their, their sort of the, the presiding genius among them, Alexander Hamilton understood, that in order to sort of establish a society of that kind, you had to do, among other things, at least two sort of fundamental or basic things. One was you had to establish or provide what was called a circulating medium, i.e. a money, to enable people actually to exercise what economists subsequently came to call effective demand, right? Basically, you needed people to be able to buy the products of industry in order for industry to have the incentives to produce, to be industry, in other words, or to be industrious at all. So you needed the circulating medium on the one hand, and then you needed the basic, the fundamental capacities to do that making or producing or manufacturing on the other hand. To put a shorthand way of putting this is they understood that you need, there were certain material prerequisites to having both supply on the one hand and demand on the other in order to have a fully formed economy, a, circ a circulation economy. Uh, and so a commercial republic required a circulating medium on the one hand and the means of producing, the, 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 the sort of capacity to produce on the other. Now, the genius of Hamilton was that he provided us with both, right? He provided an architecture for both. He provided on the one hand something that could function as a circulating medium, as a money, even in a country that had very little gold or silver or specie, as they called it back then. The, one of the first uses for US Treasury security was to function as essentially a form of paper money or as the backing for other kinds of paper money. He did that on the one hand. And then he also, of course, provided for, uh, gave us effectively the first national infrastructure bank, right? The first NIB in the Bank of the US. And the Bank of the US was specifically designed to do exactly what Elfeka said it was meant to do. It was meant to help jumpstart infrastructure projects all over the country and also to assist with nascent industries uh, in this country as well. He also founded a group uh, that some of you know about or have heard about called the Society for the Promotion of Useful Manufacturers. It was in a sense, the first industrial park, the first sort of industrial um, uh, sort of uh, cooperative, you might say, set in Patterson, New Jersey. And you can still to this day, you can go and visit Patterson, New Jersey and see where the waterworks were, where the mills were built. And basically the idea was to make America a kind of cutting edge technological society and productive society within the context of the late 18th and early 19th century. The program worked beautifully for, for decades, um, and it also found expression in a sense, a kind of theoretical expression in the shape that political economy took over the course of the 19th century. The political economy of the 19th century wasn't simply focused on demand or on basically the sort of monetary side of the economy or the effective demand side of the economy, it was also concerned with the productive side of the economy. And indeed, if you open up the opening pages of those early treatises on political economy, including Adam Smith's, they say that the whole point of political economy is to sort of get an understanding as to what it is or what, what's required for a society to become what they called opulent, i.e. productive and wealthy in a material sense, not just in a sort of paper sense. Now, what happened in the aftermath of that? Well, it, um, it's a sad story, actually, but in the late 19th century, political economy was displaced by what came to be called economics. This was the so-called marginal or marginalist revolution in the 1870s. And the fundamental problem with marginalism and with most of orthodox economics ever since that period is that it's entirely lost sight, lost sight of the productive or the supply side of the economy. The marginal revolution was all about the demand side, about the utility that people derive by consuming things with no attention paid at all to how things get produced or how you have to organize institutionally in order to be productive, in order to be a sort of fecund and wealth generating sort of society. Economics basically took a wrong turn at that point. In a certain sense, it's almost as though it's been operating with a phantom limb ever since, right? We have a left arm and a right arm. You have a left brain and a right brain. Now imagine if somebody severed the corpus callosum between the two hemispheres of your brain and just tossed out one of the halves of your brain. That's in effect what economics has become. It's become half a brain because it pays absolutely no attention these days to production or to the supply side. Now, 
to see just how perverse that is, and this is going to fast forward us fast forward us right into the moment, the present moment, to see how perverse this is. Just consider somebody like Larry Summers, right? Or a lot of other people who are following Larry Summers' cue right now. So they notice that we've got an inflation problem, right? The prices have been rising. And so what do they suggest? Well, they say, well, we've got to cut back on that demand. There's just too much demand out there. So what we need is we need at least one year with an at least 10% unemployment rate. This is exactly what Larry Summers prescribed just a few weeks ago. One year with a 10% uh, unemployment rate, we need maybe two years with a 6.5% unemployment rate or five years with a five or more percent unemployment rate. In other words, we have to throw people out of work, we have to sacrifice production, we have to make people suffer, get people more people rendered homeless, more people rendered impoverished, more people losing their health and their health insurance and health care, more people losing their educational opportunities. We basically have to just write off a huge number of people. Now, it's easy for Larry, of course, to suggest these things because he's a multimillionaire and he's also at the end of his career. He doesn't really have much, you know, much, much time left as a, as a sort of policy walk, hopefully no, no more than three seconds at this point. But in any event, it's easy for him to say things like this from a kind of individual sort of utility point of view. But if we ask what could intellectually motivate something like that, and what could motivate sort of other people to make similar uh, claims to the effect that, well, only the Fed can, can handle this. The Fed is going to have to tighten up on the money supply, tighten up on monetary policy in order to shrink aggregate demand, in order to bring those prices down. If we ask ourselves what intellectually made this possible, well, it all lies in that observation that I made a moment ago about how economics basically lost half of its brain or it's the, the phantom limb of economics problem. Because if you think about it, what is inflation? Well, it's a relation, right? Isn't it the relation between the quantity and, and, and velocity of the money supply on the one hand and the quantity of goods and services that can be purchased with that money on the other hand? In other words, you've all heard that phrase, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. That makes it pretty clear that we're talking about a relational phenomenon here, a two-sided phenomenon. There's money and there's goods. If you have too much money chasing too few goods, that suggests that you can work from either or both sides of the equation, right? If you have too much money chasing too few goods, you can shrink the money supply, i.e. shrink the effective demand, or you can boost the goods supply, you can boost the supplies, you can boost the production. That's the other side of the equation that doesn't require that you throw a bunch of people out of work and destroy their lives and destroy their families and destroy their homes and destroy their health and destroy their environment. That's the side you work on if those things don't look like a good idea to you, which they apparently do look to Larry Summers. But as I've noted, or as I noticed, right, in effect, orthodox economists basically all poked out one eye and they, they're all basically one-eyed pirates with patches over their eye holes on the other sides of their faces. And all they can imagine is cutting back on the money supply. And you know the old saying, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Well, all they've got is monetary policy in the Fed. And so everything looks like a monetary policy problem. And therefore, the only way to deal with uh, the inflation problem is to shrink the money supply and shrink the effective demand. Now, if we repudiate that nonsense, that rubbish, if we go back to the tradition of Anglo-American or Western and then beyond Western political economy, because political economy as it was conceived in the late 18th and then early mid 19th century spread not only to the US and, and to Europe, but it also spread to Japan and other success stories. Indeed, once you get into the 20th century, the most interesting economists are no longer Western at all because the Western economists all become these kind of demand siders. Um, and the only people concerned with production and supply anymore, as far as economists or practical economic states persons are concerned, are in other countries like Japan or China or Korea or the other Asian tiger economies or many of the Latin American economies now and increasingly many of the, many of the African economies now. But in any event, the thing to do is to go back to our roots, which we can actually paradoxically see well at work in lots of other countries now that are following the Hamiltonian model, even after we've um, um, ejected it or, or, or rejected it, um, and rediscover our own productive capacities and the secret of 
enhancing productive capacity. And the way to do that is to go back to the Hamiltonian model, but of course to update it in 21st century form. And that's exactly what the NIB proposal uh, that Alfeca uh, elaborated for you guys a moment ago is doing. So in a sense, I'll close, I guess, by saying that in a sense, what we're talking about here then is something that on the one hand is kind of retro, but on the other hand is kind of very futuristic and very forward looking. We're basically talking about getting a head start on all of the great industries of tomorrow, the industries that are going to be earth preserving, environment preserving, good high paying quality jobs preserving, community preserving, and in the end, nation preserving. That's what we're talking about. That's both futuristic and traditional. Uh, and so it ought to have a sort of nostalgic resonance on the one hand, but a kind of shiny, exciting, new futuristic sort of resonance on the other hand. That's what we're talking about here. And we will we'll really be making history uh, in effect, not simply by repeating it, but by repeating it in a, in a sort of new and improved form. Uh, so I'll close, I'll close with that for now. Thank you, Professor Hockett. That was fascinating. Um, next, we will go to uh, Ellen Brown, who is the author, it is an author of multiple uh, books, and the chairman and founder of the Public Banking Institute. Ellen? In the mid 20th century, of course, the, the US was the world's leader in infrastructure and development. Uh, that's no longer true. As we know, China has done an amazing job <laughs> of running circles around us. Um, probably its most impressive achievement is that it built 23,500 miles of high-speed rail from 2008 to 2022, and we haven't built any effectively, nothing that really qualifies for that term. So how did they fund it? Uh, the Chinese government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including three giant development banks. And they also have a broad ne network of local banks, which um, Professor Richard Werner in the UK says essential for a thriving uh, productive economy because you need the local banks, they know the local businesses. And in the case of China, for example, they're willing to take risks because they have the backing of these big national government banks. And through all that from 2008 to 2022, uh, the price the prices did not it did not cause inflation in fact prices went down or initially and you can see they've hovered right around two percent through that whole period and right now they're at 2.5 percent which is quite good so unlike if you just pump the money out there or if you borrow from the central bank which just creates the money on its books which would be inflationary we presume um, if you borrow from banks, it's a circular system. You borrow from the bank, the, the money gets paid back, and it's paid back with the proceeds from whatever infrastructure you built. In this case, it would be trains, train fees. Uh, Germany is another country that has a very large infrastructure bank, KFW, that works with an extensive local banking network, uh, particularly the Sparkassen, which are publicly owned banks. Um, Germany has been called the world's first major energy economy. Renewables generated 41% of its electricity in 2017, up from 6% in 2000. And this was a 72% funded by KFW working with the Sparkas and the, the public savings banks. KFW also provides 1% loan to small businesses during the pandemic. And if you're a business and you take out a, an, an, a loan for investment or working capital, KFW has probably uh, assumed a large part of your, uh, your loan. In the US, we actually have more local banks than any other country, but we don't have a national coordinating bank for infrastructure and development. Community banks shrank from over 8,000 to about 5,000 in 15 years. Uh, we have one state that's managed to maintain its a, a strong local bank uh, network, and that's North Dakota. And what do they have that's different? They have more local banks per capita than any other state. They also have a state-owned bank, the Bank of North Dakota, which um, actually partners with the local banks. It doesn't try to compete with them like the Wall Street banks. And uh, so it helps them with capitalization and with liquidity and, it, and by assuming a large part of the risk. Uh, 
it was set up in 1919 as part of a farmer's revolt against the big out-of-state banks that were foreclosing on the farm. So rather than being a competitive thing, it's it's the bank for the local banks. It's like a, a, a correspondent bank for the local banks or it's sort of like a central bank for the state. And it's done very well. According to the, uh, the Wall Street Journal in 2014, it's more profitable than Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan Chase. And its last annual report reported a return on investment of 15% and $10 billion in assets, which is quite big for a state the size of North Dakota. Plus, it has an S&P standard and poor rating of A+. Uh, the Bank of North Dakota had a faster and better response to COVID than any other state, again, with its local banks working through the Bank of North Dakota. Um, they, they coordinated the uh, unemployment benefits through the community banks 10 times faster than the slowest state. They managed to get more PPP funds per worker than any other state. And as Bob pointed out, uh, really, you could say that the US established the infrastructure bank model, even though it wasn't called an infrastructure bank. Uh, the first US bank was designed for infrastructure and development. Uh, after the, the Revolutionary War, we had a federal debt of $70 million, which was huge at the time, and $44 million of that was the uh, state's debts, the colonies, which had become states. So Hamilton had to solve this <laughs> debt problem, and he did it with debt for equity swaps. So debt was uh, accepted in partial payment for stock in the first U.S. bank. And then the bank did what all banks do, which is leverage that capital into credit um, 10 to, at 10 to 1. That was called the frank, fractional reserve system. Today, the, when a bank makes a loan, they just write that into your deposit account, as a, uh, and now you've got a deposit. But then they print, actually printed the money. So this 10 to 1 was paper money, and it became the, the first US currency, which Bob also pointed out. Um, so Hamilton has been accused of founding our uh, Wall Street system, you know, our speculative system, but, but it, it wasn't. Uh, the, Hamilton's uh, fractional reserve system was substantially different than the Bank of England, which, which established that model, at least for, for, <laughs> for England and its colonies. Um, the difference was that Unlike the Bank of England, the primary function of the U U.S. Bank was to be to issue credit for internal improvements and other economic development under Hamilton's system of public credit. So it was to be a source of productive wealth for the economy, not just financial profit. And then the second U.S. Bank was also on the Hamiltonian model, and it was the one that really did a lot of physical production, including the Erie Canal. That was probably its most most impressive <laughs> piece of output. And then uh, the second US bank was closed down, of course, by uh, Andrew Jackson. And Lincoln didn't actually have an infrastructure bank, but what he did or what his, um, what his government did on the Hamiltonian model was to set up the national banking system. And the national banks were required to use debt or to buy some of the government's debt and to use that as part of their capitalization. And that's also what HR 3339 would do on this model. So then we got, of course, the Federal Reserve, which it was hoped would be funding infrastructure, but it didn't really happen. But in 1933, what we got, that's the closest thing that we've had to an infrastructure bank in the last century was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation under Roosevelt, again, on the Hamiltonian model. It started with a mere $500 million in capitalization. And over the next 25 years, it lent or invested over $40 billion, rebuilt the whole country under the New Deal, and funded America's participation in World War II. So did a quite remarkable job. And at the end of all that, managed to turn a profit for the government. Um, so we could do the same. We just have to basically declare war on crumbling infrastructure and just get in there and do it. Uh, there are currently four banks, uh, four bank bills before Congress, but the only one that's adequate for, um, oh, you can't see this chart. <laughs> but anyway, of the four, the only one that comes anywhere near being able to fund $5 trillion in infrastructure is HR 3339. 
the others, the highest is uh, 250 billion, which is, or no, I'm sorry, 500 billion, I guess. But anyway, 25 over. Okay. Anyway, um, plus a couple of them are on the public private partnership model, which we know is going to cost us more than it will save over the long run. So um, that's all I have time for, I guess. But thank you very much. We need HR 3339 to. Uh, start our war on crumbling infrastructure. Thank, thank you, Ellen. And uh, where can we find your books? Oh, uh, my website is ellenbrown.com, but I'm also chairman of the Public Banking Institute. So publicbankinginstitute.org. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, I would like to go to New York. We have the Honorable Felix Ortiz, former assistant speaker of the New York Assembly. Felix? Hi, good evening or good afternoon for some of those who are in another side of the country. Uh, it is a great uh, to be with all of you here tonight uh, from New York. I am sitting in my backyard in Brooklyn. Finally, I'm, I got home uh, after a couple of years been traveling around and doing some other stuff. Uh, sleeping on my bed tonight. So um, uh, so let me just uh, let me just uh, point out a couple of things. I think uh, for those of you who are new into this, I would recommend that uh, you folks who really should reach out to Alveca Motardi to get all the information about the National Infrastructure Banking. Uh, it's very important that uh, if you are a legislator and you are willing to step to the plate to help us to convince or let's put it this way, to have your congressman to get convinced himself or herself uh, to support the natural infrastructure banking and why it's so important. And it's a, I, would, I, would say, I, would, I would say that in three, in three quick points. Number one, does not increase taxes. Number two, if we want China to control us, it's time for us to step to the plate and develop an infrastructure uh, agenda that will develop number three, which is security for our community regarding job growth and economic development. And that's, uh, and, and it's, uh, and it doesn't involve any increase in local, state and federal taxes. So I would say, if you wanna make it simplistic, just do it that way. And number, and number fifth, I would say this, uh, when Biden was in Europe, he spoke on the G7 and in the G7, he expressed himself very, very, clamor to say that I believe what Europe needs, the European Union needs, is, a, is, a, is an infrastructure banking. We should come all together to ensure that we will be able to help Europe. Well, yes, we can help Europe. But like my father used to say, if you don't help and take care of your health first in your own country, it's very impossible for us to help others. Uh, and, uh, and that's very blunt and straight to the point. Uh, I, uh, I was very impressed, by the way, I was not expecting that Tom Swasey was trying to be on the agenda after I saw him really and, and uh, uh, sending a video, but I'm very close to Tom Swasey. He and I know each other very, very well. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, as you probably know, Tom Swasey ran for governor. Uh, he's no longer gonna be a congressperson. But uh, in the meantime, I think we should take advantage of Tom Swasey to see how, you know, all that anger and frustration that he had that the Democratic Party didn't support him, uh, that he can come back and say, well, let me see how I can use the, all that energy to help the National Infrastructure Banking uh, uh, folks to have meeting with Congress people uh, in, uh, in, in Washington. I think that's, uh, that will be fantastic if we know how to pull that trigger uh, to continue hammer uh, Tom Swasey to help us to do that. Uh, furthermore, uh, I was a former, uh, I was a former executive uh, board member for the National Conference State Legislators. And for all of us who are, uh, who are here, and for those of you who are legislators, state senator and, and assembly member or a state rep or a delegate, uh, a huge job is really to try to uh, help Senator Bill Tolman uh, when, uh, when the National Conference State Legislature take place in Denver in August 1st to August 5th. He's going to need help uh, to trying to convince other legislators uh, why this resolution 
uh, that is being put together and the National Conference State Legislature is putting on the agenda is so critical and so important. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I do believe that it will be important as well to reach out to the, uh, uh, the, the, chair, the, the new president to be uh, for the National Conference State Legislature, which is uh, uh, Representative Kennedy from Rhode Island, and, uh, and have, uh, have him to have a voice uh, that to ensure that we will be able to get this to the executive committee to have a great conversation on the executive committee of the National Conference State Legislature. I served I serve in the assembly for 26 years. I was a member of the National Conference State Legislature since the first day I got in because my speaker didn't want to travel. So he said, if you want to travel, that's your baby. You can go ahead and do whatever the hell you want. So I took advantage. And I, be, I will tell you this much. This is very interesting dynamic because you have Democrat, Republican working together at the national level. And, uh, and the National Conference State Legislature, it does carry a big heavyweight if the resolution gets passed because that gets sent to the Congress. And, and also we can use Senator, I don't mean to use him, but you know we can take the good faith of Senator Tellman uh, because he's the sacrificing lamb at this point to go there and do the job uh, to give him all the ammunition that he needs to ensure that the National Conference State Legislature when they meet in December in Washington, that we will be able to have meetings in Washington, legislator, state legislator to help us, to help us to ensure that uh, the Congress folks will be able to be more informed about what the National Infrastructure Banking is all about. So, so it's, a, it's, a very, it's very critical and very important that, uh, that, that yes, we have 14 members of Congress, that's nice, but we need to continue to hammer because the game is not over yet and we need to make sure that we, we, we galvanize on this. Lastly, uh, the last thing I will say is, I had traveled to China over 20, uh, from my 25 years, 1995 up to, to 2019, twice a year. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a lecturer. I have lecture at the University of Shanghai and Beijing, Nanjing and Tianjin University. So I have, will have the opportunity and the pleasure to really uh, lecture PhD students and also to think and to, and to develop this kind of think tank and thinking me me mechanism about the economy, the, uh, the, the, the global economy uh, and how the global economy is impacting, you know, the Asia, Europe, Japan and United States. So when I went to China in 1995 to finalize my statement is that I saw a lot of farm all over the place. I went back in 1998 was already a lot of infrastructure building. And as you probably know, China just the other day announced that they're going to do another multi, multi infrastructure banking uh, uh, and they were planning to put it in place because at the end of the day, it's about how can we connect people for jobs? How can we connect people for jobs that they can come to work in Manhattan, but get the hell out of Manhattan and go back to Brooklyn, to Bronx and to Staten Island, Long Island? Why should I keep everybody in Manhattan? No, I don't want that. So the same mentality uh, uh, was is with China. China would like to bring the people from Fuzhou to Canton, come to Shanghai, but they want them. China want these people to go back home. They don't want them to stay in Shanghai. So this is a, this is a very uh, uh, a critical moment for us, uh, and I think that I encourage every single legislator who has managed and, and city council as well, or ornament, or the local government people that we have to ensure that uh, that that they will continue to put phone calls to the Congress people because the pressure had to go to the Congress people. They had to feel that pressure. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is that the infrastructure banking uh, and infrastructure as a whole is not on anybody's agenda at this point because they're doing so many other stuff uh, in Washington this day. I will be in Washington in August 10th through the 15th uh, in another matter, but I will have I have a couple of meetings in the White House and I will bring the infrastructure, despite the fact it's not part of the agenda, I will bring it up to as a topic as well. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, uh, Professor Hawker, you always rock. Thank you very much for, uh, I, I, let me tell you, I take a lot of notes. I, I wanna be like you at some point and then, that I can explain it so smoothly like that. Uh, and uh, Ms. Brown, uh, uh, Ellen, you as well, and Rebecca, thank you very much. And let's continue this fight 
until we finally get what we want. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank so thanks. great, Assemblyman. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks, Felix. We appreciate it. I do want to say that we're having some great discussions in the chat, so please feel free to check that out and join in. Uh, our next speaker hails from the great state of Florida, a state uh, where I understand the average uh, elevation above sea level is only four feet and the streets of Miami regularly flood with seawater. So we have with us Bobby Knost, who's the business manager for Iron Workers Local 808. Bobby? Uh, thank you, Ms. Julian. And thank you, Stuart, for, for uh, inviting me to this. I think this is the third or maybe fourth time I've been involved in watching these. And when he asked me to do it, not only was I, I still am very nervous uh, <laughs> talking with people and uh, with people like Robert and, and such. But um, I think I have a little different spin on everything. And maybe this will help us as well. So the biggest thing is um, I'm, I'm even missing Senator Vic Torres. Um, his birthday party tonight to do this because I think this is that important and we have a really good relationship with him and Congressman Darren Soto and others through the iron workers and we're going to beat their drum about this thing and we're going to we're going to help you guys that way so that's a big one for me and that's the reason I'm here and I, I really thank you guys but um, I want to say uh, it is so important that we do get these funds versus just infrastructure because I know in Florida uh, I've lived here all my life since 1962. I've been an iron worker, union iron worker since 1984 when I got out of the Marine Corps. And I have seen Orlando and the eight counties that we represent blow up. It's crazy. We have people from all over this world come here to use our travel areas, our cars, our rails, our roads, everything. And it's super important. There's never enough money to do what we need to do. And it's very important. I want to touch too on the people that were talking about the, it needing to be Davis Bacon. That is a super important part of this thing. Um, we see all the time, we do have a little bit of bright rail right now that's uh, went, oh, it's probably 120 miles we've got done, but it was done with a company from the Netherlands. And so they get that money, they take it back home and we don't see it. And then on top of that, in Florida, we have a lot of, uh, illegal uh, workers and they exploit these workers and that's not right and I don't like it and we don't like it we everybody needs a chance you know back in the day when a lot of us in this in this chat here first came across here in a ship probably you walked in one side of a building you walked out the other side and you was an American try that now it doesn't work we have to get back to where we can help these people and not let them be exploited I was on a project just not not long ago, there was 12 illegals out there working, living in a 12 by 60 trailer with no running water, no toilet, no electricity, and that's not right. And that's not the way we should be as Americans. And so I want all these people helped and I'm gonna do everything in my power and we do to help these people. Um, these projects, like I said, need to be more awarded to the folks that are right here. And I, I believe that's what a lot of us agree on is that you know, we don't build cars here. We don't do all these things that we need to do. We got to get that stuff back. If we don't, we're just, we're, we're slaves to everybody else that's doing it for it. We can't be that way. I think that's super important. And uh, Robert, you hit it on the nail and you always do. You, uh, you amaze me. I tell my wife, you got to see this guy right here. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, everybody, I, I really thank you for everything that we're doing. Um, we, we want to get our congressmen and women and our senators on board on this thing. Because at first I was even calling it wrong. NIB, I thought it was National Infrastructure Bill. And here it is, the bank. And then once I educated and listened to you guys and know what we're doing, it made all the sense in the world. And I actually talked to Senator Vic Torres just minutes before I got home tonight and told him I couldn't make his birthday party, but that when I got done, we were gonna meet next week and we're gonna talk about how we can introduce him to this and get him on board. And he's really a super guy. I know we can do these things. So it's gonna be important to do that. I want you to know that Florida is involved. Um, we have four locals in this area right here in Tampa, uh, uh, West Palm Beach, Miami, Jacksonville, uh, and others. And we cover the whole state of Florida, but yet we only have 16% of the market share in this in, this, in Florida. That's not good, that's not good. We've got to do better. We have a thousand members in our local uh, ourselves. 
I've uh, never been a political person. I've never held any kind of an office. I was just an iron worker up there walking up on the iron and four years ago in 2018. And all the guys that I work with said, oh, that fat guy, he always helps us out. So we want him going there. So that's how I got here. And I think uh, that's an advantage to a, a point because I don't think like everybody else. And I know you guys don't, you know, it's not, well, that's the way it's always been. If we keep doing that's the way it's always been, we're going to be dinosaurs. We have to look at different things. We have to figure out different ways to get back to what we were doing that worked. You know, these guys did this in the iron workers and the international, and they started this thing in 1896 in Pittsburgh. That was six people that did that. And they did it just for that reason, just for that reason. They had people dying every day, people standing on the sidewalk, waiting for somebody. Now why would they have people dying? Why would they do that? That seems wrong. <laughs> so, you know, really, that's the tough. reason we do need to be organized and we need to uh, keep these jobs here in America. I won't take up any more of your time, but thank you all for, for allowing me to talk and maybe put a little bit different spin on this thing. Thank you, Bobby, for sharing your perspective. That was great. Uh, really good to hear from you. And now I don't uh, really want to put the pressure on our next speaker. However, uh, Walt McRee, you are our last speaker before we get to Q&A. So with that, I'd like to introduce Walt McCree, Chair Emeritus of the Public Banking Institute. Walt? Thanks very much. And hi, everybody. Uh, bat up or a cleanup batter is what I was called, <laughs> I think. Uh, and, and I think it was because uh, we basically want to have us all focus on what the work to do next is and how obvious and why. But I want to step back a little bit further and sort of build on what Bob was talking about context. He gave us this marvelous historical context about where we came from as, a, as an economy and, and as a monetary system as well. Uh, and if we don't see ourselves from where we came from, we're really, we don't know where we're coming from. So um, that, that context has a variety of different aspects to it. One of it is very, you know, is monetary and physical. The other is mental. Uh, and what Bob suggested uh, has happened, and I think we've seen this in our economy, is that is that we have gone from a productive or a production oriented economy into one that is a profit centered economy. It's all about trying to make as much money as you possibly can. And uh, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, you know, and the rest of it is really a, a, a matter of, uh, well, uh, good luck, I suppose. So our monetary past or our historical context for our monetary past uh, is really not a far reach uh, from our reality today. What we avoided through Hamilton's system in terms of getting the Bank of England off of our back uh, and other uh, international uh, financial oligarchs uh, is, uh, has kind of come back to roost. The financial houses uh, in, in the United States government really run the roost. They own pretty much the government, uh, as Dick Durbin might say out of Illinois. Uh, we have cities, counties, and states that pay uh, $160 billion a year just in interest. So all of that money is getting sucked out of our local economies in order to, to do what? To be able to pay for the money that we basically give them through taxes and other things for the things that we need for our infrastructure, for example. Well, we want to build a bridge. We got to go to the. We don't have it in our on our uh, annual budget, so we go to Wall Street to the bond market. And when we go to the private capital markets, that typically doubles the cost of what the public has to pay to improve our lot. So, with the National Infrastructure Bank, we're going back to a model that we know works. That's independent of that. Uh, we have, of course, an urgent need. I don't need to uh, to give you a long list, but we know the devastating social impacts. Of, a, of this capitalist system, this profit-based uh, system that has run amok through cronyism and inequality, um, that's increased the risk of our infrastructure systems that aren't gonna stand for much more of this abuse and deterioration. Uh, the reality that our infrastructure needs have expanded and have changed with the uh, new world of technology and all the related advantages that they could bring um, the irrefutable threat of devastating deterioration of our most essential economic resource, which is the earth, the planet that we live on, all of that is critical and it's these needs are urgent. So we have to ask ourselves, what's really keeping us from these urgent tasks? 
Eldon likes to tell a story about a spaceman who comes to Earth and sees a, a, a mess and, uh, and uh, says, what's, what's going on here? How come you can't fix this? And basically comes down that, well, we don't think we have enough money. Well, uh, th these little green bills are, are a part of our, inheritance, our inheritance. We are able to create our own credit. That's the Hamilton system. So, to, so we have here a kind of a systemic blindness, if you will, kind of a delusion. Uh, that insists that we have to abrogate the control of our own money to private money masters. Uh, now, that's a delusion that we can't uh, afford or, to, or that we can't create our, our own money, and therefore we can't afford all of these changes. Now, the public banking movement, which is a, a bank that's owned by a city, county, or state, realizes this delusion. And it's one of the reasons that that movement uh, provides what we think is a transformative opportunity. Uh, to create the credit that we need to address our needs by employing this proven methodology that Alex Hamilton got started for us uh, so long ago. And we needn't be timid about it either. I mean, we need $5 trillion. Well, great. Let's make $5 trillion uh, in credit based on our full faith in credit. Okay. Not forgetting that $5 trillion is, doesn't even come up to how much the three of our largest U.S.-based global banks have in corporate assets, all right? So let's move forward. And of course, let's do this with haste. There's really no time to waste in addressing needs needs. We know they will not wait. Uh, we have to acknowledge and work on changing this unproductive mindset that we have in our elected officials that we can't afford it. And we have to do this as individuals by getting active and in inviting our representatives to support the National Infrastructure Bank Initiative, HR 3339. Uh, it is really the, uh, the best game on the block, the best uh, bill that we can bring forward, and it's extremely timely. So that is uh, one of the prevailing context items that I think we wanna keep in mind. We're living in the delusion that, we, that this isn't our money and that we have to give it over to private to others to control. All right, uh, I, I like uh, what Bob said about uh, uh, repudiate, repudiating the nonsense that we've inherited uh, and to get on with the investment in ourselves that we can do. Let's all support 3339. Talk to your representatives. Let this, let's get this uh, underway. Thank you so much for those remarks. And with that, we're going to open up for questions and answers. So does anyone here uh, have a question they'd like to pose to any of our speakers? Uh, I have a question I'd like to pose to Professor Hockett, and that it goes back to how do we increase the supply portion of the equation? And one of the issues, as I understand it, with inflation is that uh, is consolidation in terms of the providers of uh, some of the goods and services so that oil companies are making uh, extreme profits and uh, Tyson Foods, for example, has raised the prices of their food items, and, and they're able to do it because they have a, a control of the marketplace. So how do we address that part of the equation? Do we start trying to enforce antitrust provisions, or do we make it easier for other new businesses to spring up and compete effectively? Yeah, great, great, great question, Julie. Uh, so, you know, I, I sort of, in, in a way, I sort of described the, the sort of economic history of the country and the history of sort of economic thought itself over the last 150 years, almost as a kind of fall from the garden, right? It, it was almost a sort of Adam, 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 Adam and Eve story. Uh, and then they, you know, sort of bit from the, the, the poison fruit from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was sort of a descent after that. But I, I didn't really sort of elaborate what precise shape that took over the decades. I only sort of said that the end product is Larry Summers. I think it basically there are two real serious problems that sort of resulted from that intellectual failure, that sort of willful poking out of one of the eyes um, uh, on the part of all of the economists. The first, I think Bobby hit on really, really well um, when he said that, you know, if we don't bring the production back home, we're going to end up being enslaved in effect to the people who are doing the producing from whom we're buying. That was that that point could not be more um, that can't be uh, that can't be overstated. That's uh, that's the, sig the single, I think, most important development of the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, in the American economy. And remember, one way to kind of think about the significance of that is to go back to the point that I noted at the beginning, where I said that 
Um, what Hamilton and the other founders didn't want to do was simply to remain in the same sort of relation to Great Britain after independence as before. They didn't want to be a sort of de facto colony to Britain in the way that they had previously been a de jure or legal colony of Great Britain. And that's what we would have been had we not developed our own productive capacity. Um, and in effect, then, what has happened over the last 40 or 50 years with the outsourcing of all of our productive capacities and all of our best jobs and all of our manufacturing abroad is we basically have gone back to that sort of colonial status that we once had. It's just that rather than being dominated or enslaved by Britain, we're dominated and enslaved by all of the others from, from whom we sort of purchase all of the things that are made. So that's the first fundamental challenge to our productive capacity. The second and almost as important is the one that you highlighted, Julie, and that is that we have allowed so much concentration to occur in so many um, uh, industries in this country that we've essentially given what the economists call mar market power to these sort of oligopolistic or monopolistic firms who are then able, in effect, artificially to constrain supplies in order to jack up prices, thereby causing, again, inflation. And there's lots of evidence that's come out over the last several months of price gouging behavior and of CEOs boasting to their shareholders about how under the cover of all of the talk about inflation, they've been able to raise up prices even when the costs of production have not gone up. So those two things together, I think, are the fundamental um, problems behind basically the dis dysfunctions that have afflicted our economy over the last 40 or 50 years. They are ultimately an upshot, I think, of that having forgotten the importance of the productive or supply side of the economy. Um, but once they've begun, they take on a sort of a momentum of all of their own. And I think what we have to do then is to get back both to what you said, Julie, and to what Bobby said before, is we, on the one hand, have to bring it back home, right? We have to reshore all of that offshore productive capacity that we've been basically giving away over the last 40 or 50 years. And we have to rediscover the beauty of antitrust law. And I'll close this um, reply with another cute little thing or interesting thing about the history of antitrust law and the antitrust movement in the United States. It seems to have been kind of forgotten. Um, you know, another part of another piece of this unfortunate development in contemporary economics where they forget about the supply side and they forget about production and it's all about demand and consumerism and so forth is they've kind of forgotten the purpose of the original antitrust legislation by Louis Brandeis, who thought of himself as a latter-day version of the founders, the founding generation. And that was the idea of antitrust was if you had, uh, you sort of, if you policed the size of firms, you could maximize the number of business owners and you could maximize the role of labor, the actual producers in our economy, instead of big mega banks that own so many productive companies and then outsource the production elsewhere. You could in effect make it a more labor owned or small, small proprietor owned or more labor influenced economy that way. And that was a big part of what, what Brandeis's um, uh, sort of motivations were in sort of crafting the original antitrust acts uh, in the early 20th century. But anyway, I don't wanna to go too far afield with that. I, I hope that's not too long winded an answer, but again, to, to sum it up, Two basic things we have to do to bring that productive capacity back. One is stop the offshoring and reshore it. That's getting to Bobby's point. And then the other is to rediscover the importance of competition policy, which is getting to your point, Julie. Great. Um, and I'd just like to know, when we get this resolution through Congress, are you going to be available as a consultant to um, help our, um, you know, our Congress people make sure we have the right provisions in that bill? I will if Elfeka will and if Ellen will uh, and if the rest of you guys, okay. if Bobby will, I'd be very happy to be uh, to, to help out with all of that. Okay, great. You you heard it here, everybody. He's on board. Okay, um, next I'd like to go to Michael Zupko. You have your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes, yes, I do. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for doing the speech. It's amazing, I got to say. Um, so I'm uh, with uh, Assemblywoman Carol Murphy's office uh, in the 7th Legislative District here in New Jersey. Um, I'm handling infrastructure uh, policy and everything. So I wanted to ask a couple of uh, questions, uh, someone more that can speak on the technical aspects of the bill. Um, so I understand $5 trillion is a lot of money, but it certainly isn't gonna fix all our issues in the nation as a whole. I wanted to understand more how this money could be distributed 
um, where will priorities be put? Because I know here in New Jersey, we have a lot of through traffic. We have a lot of infrastructure, a lot of lane miles, um, and we certainly need more high-speed rail and everything. While we have a high-speed rail line, it certainly is not up to standards of uh, Europe or China. Um, so that's the first part of my question. The second part would be, um, would you propose state branches, uh, state branch banks to help distribute the money or uh, regional banks like the uh, Federal Reserve uses, or would it just be a centralized bank? Because I noticed, uh, for example, China, if you use, has uh, local banks distributing money so they can uh, uh, curtail it more towards the local economies and stuff. So I just wanted if any of you that can speak on this, uh, can you give your insight? Thank you. Sure, sure. I think we'll uh, go to Alfeca and see if you uh, can address a couple of Michael's comments. Yes, thank you very much. And those are great questions. Uh, so we really envisage that the rollout of infrastructure needs to solve some big problems. Uh, on the uh, transportation side, we can't keep throwing money at more lanes and widening roads because obviously this is not working. Uh, we feel your pain in New Jersey. We, some of us live in uh, the DC area. We don't go out of our houses around rush hour. Uh, our highways are now five lanes wide in each direction and it's just a parking lot with tolls on top of it. This is not working. And we, we tell our legislators, come on, this is our tax dollars. We need to have more rail in our transportation mix to move commuters back and forth. We need to get the whole Northeast corridor up to high speed rail line efficiency. That's going to take a, a lot of hands on deck. There are 2,500 bridges to repair. We have to straighten out the track lines because they can't, they're too curvy to go that fast. We have a lot of jurisdiction problems. We have to, you know, where, where bridges cross state lines, we have to work on all those things. And we have to have state of the art transportation logistics, which we don't, we're not really capable of right now in our, in our technology. So there's lots of work to be done. Yes, it thanks. can be done. We used to be the premier at all of these things. We want to work with regional planners that, uh, because we know, for example, a state like New Jersey is one of the most concentrated uh, uh, population wise, densely populated. It's a pass through state. Uh, it has a lot of transportation problems. Add on to that all of your water problems. You've still got a lot of lead service lines. A lot of utility work underneath the roads needs to be fixed. It's going to be a very large job. It can be done. It needs great planning. We need to have uh, regional oh, planner oh, accelerator groups to work on this. And we need to work with local banks to act as maybe storefronts. We need, uh, but that's not going to be enough to maybe vet loans. You have a national, you have a, a state infrastructure bank there. They can start to vet loans and act like a storefront for the national infrastructure bank. And we might need to have um, uh, um, uh, sharing of loan uh, um, responsibilities uh, where we, we would be the, the NIB would be the lender of the last resort and also the guarantor of the last resort. But we're going to need a lot of cooperation and all hands on deck to build out much better infrastructure and transportation infrastructure than we have right now. Can I toss one quick thing in here, just as a, a quick, just a, a, a big thing, thing idea. Um, the um, One of the great things about the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation arrangement, was that the RFC itself actually had a presence in every regional Federal Reserve Bank. So getting back to Mike, the end of Michael's question, when he asked about the possibility of a, a sort of a regional structure like the Federal Reserve structure, um, we could, in effect, the NIB could piggyback on the Fed structure itself by having a presence within each of the regional Federal Reserve District banks and even the branch offices of those district banks. As you, as you probably know, Michael, like the San Francisco Fed has a huge office in Los Angeles. The Dallas Fed has huge offices in various cities in Texas and so forth. And all of those could, in theory, I, I think Alfeca would agree, could, in theory, have some kind of an NIB presence in them so that they could kind of coordinate together. Actually, the bill already calls for that. Oh, it does. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, we had a comment in the chat that I think was addressed to Professor Hockett. It uh, comes from Susan Harris. 
And she was wondering or was hoping that you could have mentioned the coordinating body that you had talked about last time. And could you briefly uh, uh, explain that to the folks here on the on the call? Yeah, I'll be really, really brief about that. In a couple of the other uh, talks that we've had, I, I pointed out that um, one sort of variation on or a kind of a further elaboration of the original Hamiltonian model that turned out to be quite successful, both in the First World War mobilization and in then the Second World War mobilization was to pair up the sort of strong national bank that would finance projects with a democratically accountable coordinating body that would sort of determine what projects have to be pursued. And in this coordinating body would determine those questions, you know, what projects should be concerned, uh, could, uh, pursued with a view to all of the distinct industries that constitute the economy, all of the distinct regions, states, and localities that constitute the country, so as to assure, for one thing, a kind of coherence in all of the projects together, so they wouldn't be operating at cross purposes, and so that they wouldn't be operating in sort of wasteful ways, so they could sort of, in effect, piggyback on one another insofar as synergies were, were possible. Um, and also the other reason uh, that motivated that model was to ensure a certain kind of equity, right? You wanted to make, you want to make sure that every region in the country and indeed every locality is benefiting by the projects rather than just a couple of uh, areas like Silicon Valley or the upper Northeast or what have you. Um, and so the model, uh, the version that this model took or that this sort of two tier or sort of pairing model took in the First World War was with the War Finance Corporation, which was the predecessor to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, you also had what was called a War Industries Board or WIB. And it was essentially charged with mobilizing the nation's productive capacities in the defense sensitive sectors when the US looked like it was going to get involved in the First World War, which it did. And then we replicated that model in the Second World War. In addition to the RFC, which was now the successor to the WFC, was the financing body, the sort of the NIB of the 1930s, 40s, and early 50s, you also had the Defense Production Board. Um, and you also had, uh, well, let's just, I'll just leave it with the Defense Production Board. Uh, but it was the same idea, right? You're sort of coordinating all of the different industries that are going to be involved in the mobilization. And you're making sure that you're spreading out the projects all across the country so that you have people building in California and on the East Coast and everywhere in between. Um, and so what I've put forward and what is actually probably going to be proposed in Congress almost as a kind of complement bill to the NIB bill that I've been sort of uh, obsessively focused on for the last little while uh, is called uh, the National, um, what's it called? <laughs> Sorry, the National Reconstruction and Continuous Development Act uh, that looks like it might be getting bipartisan support. And the idea there is to establish a coordinating body. Oh, there it is. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks for putting that up there. Uh, the idea there is to uh, uh, establish that sort of coordinating body as a kind of companion uh, to the NIB type body. Um, and the idea then is, is to get democratic accountability on the one hand, and then full regional and cross industrial diversity or diversification on the other hand. And, you know, we, we've done miracles with that sort of pairing. I mean, the Second World War mobilization was a production miracle, and it, the war was probably won in American factories as at least as much as it was uh, in the Eastern Front and Western Front of the European theater and in the Pacific theater. And, and we can do it again. And uh, as Ellen, uh, I think, very provocatively and very uh, inspiringly noted in a, a message message to me earlier today. Um, in effect, what we're faced with now is the sort of what the old, the great uh, American philosopher William James would have called the moral equivalent of, of war. Instead of mobilizing to fight a foreign enemy this time, however, we're we have to mobilize to confront the enemy of deindustrialization, the enemy of inflation, the enemy of planetary destruction, the enemy of inequality and worsening inequality, the enemy of, de of hollowing out of productive capacity and the loss of uh, American labor and, and good high paying quality jobs. That's at least as important. Uh, those are at least as important as the enemies that we had to fight in the second and first world wars, it seems to be, especially the planetary or the climate one. That's totally existential. Um, so we need a miracle of that sort again. But the great news is we've done it multiple times, at least four times in our history, right, with Hamilton and then the Lincoln period and then the First World War and the Second World War. So we can we can we can do this <laughs> if I could you know, quote the bumper sticker again. And I think that's maybe the way to try. 
Thank, thank you, Professor Hockett. Um, we've got uh, Tim Porter with his hand up. I would like to um, say that he is with the Northwest Ohio Passenger Rail Association. So he probably knows a little bit about high-speed rail and how important it would be to our country. Uh, Tim, did you have some questions? Yes, uh, my main question, I've been listening to several of these over the last year. And my main question is, are, who's going to run the NIB once it gets established? Is it the NIB coalition that's, uh, you know, producing this or is it somebody else or how is it, how is it going to run? Um, we'll turn that over to Alfeca, but um, I think some other people had asked about the text of the bill. And if you go to our website, you will find a link um, so that you would be able to read it. It is quite extensive and I'm sure um, Professor Hockett could share a link where people could see the text of his bill also that might be helpful. But Alfeca, could you address that question, please? Sure. The, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank is enacted under the U.S. Government Corporations Act. That means it becomes a government-owned corporation, much like other financial institutions that already exist, like the Export-Import Bank, the bank that uh, funds uh, food and agriculture and farmers, the ins that, that uh, does insurance, uh, uh, you know, backstopping, those kinds of things, uh, are all government-owned corporations. And each one of them, even though the, the purpose of this one is to lend for infrastructure, as a government corporation, it's, it's similar in that it's a standalone institution. It has a board of directors that are um, uh, nominated by the president and approved by Congress. Okay. The act requires that these directors have uh, expertise in engineering and building infrastructure and also representation from state and local governments, unions, minority groups, those kinds of things to make sure that they're all well represented in the execution of the infrastructure projects. And then, uh, then there are several layers of governance within that institution to make sure that projects stay on track. There's no corruption or anything like that. Uh, all the loans must be um, transparent and reported by Congress. Uh, loan officers will check up on loans to make sure that um, features of the loan, uh, for example, hiring a, a fair share of minorities and things like that are actually enforced and, and, and take place. The infrastructure that's that will be funded is actually set out and, des and described in the uh, bank and the uh, so that we make sure that um, all of the kinds of inf the hard infrastructure that we want to target to get fixed actually do get fixed. Uh, and then there are, is an inspector general, audits and those kinds of things, normal bank practices to make sure that the loans are all repaid. And these, all of these procedures were used by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the most recent bank, which was also a very large bank. Uh, and there was zero corruption. All of these really complicated projects like this miraculous Tennessee Valley Authority uh, project. And I cannot tell you how really, from an engineering point of view, how really miraculous that project was uh, and how developmental it went into the very poorest area in the country, uh, did uh, development, everything improved, the economy flourished and uh, we had productive industries come out of it like hydro uh, electricity production and aluminum production and taming a wild river and all those barges. I mean, can you imagine barge traffic uh, when you have 30 or more dams on one river? That's, it was really, it's really a, an astounding feat. And we can build infrastructure like that and uh, the government can do it. And uh, with all the naysayers that uh, President Kennedy talked about, I love Kennedy's speeches. He just, he's wonderful. Um, it's exactly the same thing. It's not socialist, it's not anything, it's making our lives better, building things that everybody needs, corporations need, businesses need, uh, um, you know, workers need to have uh, good paying jobs like this. So it can be done and we can do it with a bank like this. So uh, Thank you. good governance structure. Thank, thanks, Alfekat. I would really encourage everybody to go to our website and um, do some reading and yeah. uh, look at some of the materials we have there. Uh, now I'd like to go to Steve. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce your last name. CK, CK. He's got, uh, he did have his hand up and he's got some questions in the chat, but he's wanting to know um, who decides what projects will be funded. And I would just like to remind everybody that this is really kind of a trickle up 
institution where local communities are going to be prioritizing the projects that they think are most important for their area and they would prioritize their projects and send forth the ones that are most important to them and send them up to the bank for funding and then um, there will be a process within the bank to um, uh, as far as deciding which projects will be funded first. Of course, we hope to have sufficient funding to be able to handle the vast majority of those requests as they come in. Um, Steve, did you have another question? I, I thought maybe you did. Yeah, uh, yeah, I did have actually three, and I guess you started to answer the first one. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that you know there were mechanisms in place that ensured <laughs> that you know the common good is taken care of uh, in the expenditure of all these funds uh, because uh, you know when there is scarcity uh, there is going to be certain decisions made by people uh, and uh, if those people aren't trustworthy in terms of uh, focusing on the common good uh, you know this could just be another avenue for uh, a different kind of corporate greed uh, my second question was uh, uh, yeah, there's such great ideas in terms of, you know, making this real and, and it'll have so many benefits. Uh, and I just wanted you to articulate uh, which economic and political interests are uh, the ones that are fighting this and uh, any suggestions on what we can do besides, you know, lobbying our congressmen uh, to uh, kind of deal with uh, those interests that are maybe fighting uh, this from becoming a reality. Um, Alfeca, would you like to address that question? Sure. Sure. Uh, are um, there groups that are actively fighting this? I don't. I don't really uh, think. So. You know, it's not not really so much that you see. Uh, it, it's mainly a practice of the federal government that they have in mind. They can only approach things and fix things by doing spending through the budget. And I'm here to tell you, as a person who's looked at a lot of budgets around the world that our federal budget is broken. We spend most of our money on, um, you know, uh, backstopping uh, Medicare and Medicaid that aren't, that the finances are not straightened out so much, but most of our mo money of course goes into defense spending. And there's not much left over for other programs. And the thing that gets squeezed out first is infrastructure spending. So if that's the case, uh, if we have a structural budget deficit problem, then we need to have a bank like this off to the side to be able to finance infrastructure in a long term way that doesn't depend on which administration is in, in power, you know, today or tomorrow or stops a program or starts a program. But we have this institution that can provide long term funding and can lean against any recession uh, that comes along to uh, uh, because uh, what I see as a pattern is when we have inflation, the government fights it by contracting the money supply and causing a recession. And then the federal government comes along and spends money to try and get all the jobs back that were eliminated uh, on the monetary side and goes into a deficit. And that's how a lot of our deficit has ratcheted up over time. And it's a silly kind of uh, um, formula for approaching things. If we have an institution like this, we can not only build long-term infrastructure, but we can uh, push against recessions and step up spending uh, if and when we have um, you know, unemployment uh, and um, keep our economy rolling along. So, um, yeah, th those would be my, my my main answers, I guess. Thanks, Alfeca. Um, we're running uh, up against our time limit here, so we're going to take one more question from the chat. Uh, this comes from Rochelle Asher, who is wondering about deregulation and re-regulation and how that might uh impact or be impacted with the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, Professor Hockett, do you have an idea on that? Uh, just a, a couple of very uh, brief thoughts. I mean, um, f f you know, in general, it might be true that some regulatory thickets in some parts of the country somehow are standing as impediment to progress or to, you know, sort of further infrastructural development and, and the like. Um, it might be true, but I have to say that I'm somewhat skeptical because it's a very convenient sort of trope to sort of pull out if 
you're a private sector entity that is extracting rents from people and enjoying things as they are and doesn't want the perceived competition from uh, a national infrastructure bank or doesn't want uh, to see more sort of federal involvement in, in sort of rectifying our problems, a very convenient way um, of sort of, I guess, kind of pulling on certain strings or, or pushing certain buttons that certain people seem to have is to say, oh, this is just going to create more regulations or, oh, the real problem isn't the lack of affirmative productive measures being taken by the public sector, but it's because of all the red tape, you know, you know, Elon Musk would be saving everything, you know, he would be saving the day and would be rescuing the country if only he weren't constrained by those pesky insider trading laws or by those pesky contract enforcement actions or by all of those other pesky regulations. And, and you know, that line of argument is, of course, absurd because, again, what Elon Musk is in business to do is to make money for Elon Musk. And I'm not going to condemn that as such. Um, that's kind of what we've decided to allow is to allow private sector firms to try to make profits. But it's a, a terrible mistake to think that the incentives of a sectional interest or a particular company that wants to make profits for itself are always lined up with the interests of the broader public or of the country as a whole. I mean, after all, there are lots of Americans, well, I shouldn't say lots, but there are some Americans who have benefited quite handsomely by all of the outsourcing of our productive of production abroad because they get cheap labor abroad, right? So their profits are higher. Those are people whose interests, uh, if they're following their interests and if they're following their shareholders' interests, they're doing the rational thing, right, for them, but that's not what is in the interest of the country. Um, and it seems to me that oftentimes when people's interests uh, are at odds with those of the country, what they'll claim falsely is that, oh, we could solve this pro uh, you know, these national problems if you just took the regulations away. No, that's just not true. For the most part, taking the regulations away would make things even worse because all of the problems that we're faced with right now are effectively the product of no sort of central coordinating activity, no sort of planning for the country as a whole uh, at the sort of apex of the system, so to speak, and everything being left as a kind of free for all. So um, I think what we should do then is, you know, take seriously suggestions that some forms of regulation or red tape might be standing in the way, but, you know, also take them with more than one grain of salt. Be suspicious of such claims because they're very easy to make. And they typically are, are offered, I think, by people who are sort of trying to conceal something else. So, you know, take them seriously, but taking them seriously means taking them skeptically uh, and looking carefully at those sorts of claims. Thank you for that explanation. And um, with that, I want to thank all of our speakers for their time and expertise here tonight. Uh, we do have a couple slides for you. So, um, first of all, we have some news from California where um, our resolution passed unanimously through the legislature there. And uh, you see here, um, we have quite a list of co-sponsors, a quite extensive list of co-sponsors on our resolution in California. So we're very happy to see California get on board with the, the resolution. Um, next, we, um, we had Senator Tallman earlier talking about his, the resolution that he is sponsoring at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I do want to say that there's about um, 5,000 to 6,000 attendees at this conference, so we will have a lot of press, a lot of exposure uh, at that particular conference, and we are um, doing the spending for um, an ad um, on the conference's website, and so if anyone would like to uh, kick in um, a little bit of financial help for us to pay for that ad, we would appreciate it, and um, so you see there Senator Tallman. Uh, we're also going to be at the Conference of State Legislators that's coming up here soon, and I believe um, Senator Hasegawa from Washington State is our lead there, and the resolution will be introduced at that um, uh, conference as well. So um, we're really working hard at raising awareness of the resolution with le legislators around the country. Um, now, here's a, a great little tool we have for everybody, and these are some downloadable flyers that we have on our website. You see the address there. But the idea here is that you would be able to download and print these flyers and take them with you to visit your state 
uh, legislators or your Congress people. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to remember all these facts and remember the website and that sort of thing. But this way you, ha you have an easy, uh, easy, handy um, fact sheet that you would be able to take with you and share with your, um, share with your legislators, your representatives. So we'd again, urge you to visit our website. Um, Please call your member of Congress and ask them to sponsor HR 3339. We're continuing to uh, get additional sponsors and we'd like a sponsor from your state. So, um, and if you want some help uh, with contacting them, uh, you wanna set up a Zoom meeting or a webinar, we're happy to do that. We've been doing them around the country and uh, just give us a call or contact us if you'd like to set one up in your area. So, um, Thank you again for being here. And um, before you, you leave, we'd like to play a, a powerful speech by uh, John F. Kennedy and to just sort of wrap it up on, on the need for infrastructure. So thanks everyone. And, and let's listen to JFK close it out. In short, the work of TVA will never be done until the work of our country is done. There will always be new places for us to go. For in the minds of men the world over, the initials TVA stands for progress, and the people of this area welcome progress. And it stands for cooperation between public and private enterprise, between upstream and downstream interests, between those who are concerned with power and navigation, flood control and recreation, and above all, cooperation between the federal government and the seven states of this area. From time to time, statements are made labeling the federal government an outsider, an intruder, an adversary. In any free federation of states, of course, differences will arise and difficulties will persist. But the people of this area know that the United the United States government is not a stranger or not an enemy. It is the people of 50 states joining in a national effort to seek progress in every state of the Union. For without the national government, without the people of the United States working as a people, there would be no TVA. Without the national government, the people of the United States working together, there would be no protection of the family farmer, his income and his financial independence. For he never would have been able to electrify his farm, to insure his crop, to support its price, and to stay ahead of the bugs, the bull weevils, and the mortgage bankers. Only a great national effort by a great people working together can explore the mysteries of space harvest the products at the bottom of the ocean, and mobilize the human, natural, and material resources of our land. I cite these examples not to show the growth of federal activity, for it's small compared to the nation, but to show the positive side of federal-state cooperation of which TVA is an outstanding symbol. For this is and must always be one nation under God, indivisible. Franklin Roosevelt came from Hyde Park, New York, more than 1,100 miles from this community. George Norris was not a representative of this state. He came from McCook, Nebraska, also more than 1,100 miles from this community. But they knew that the conquest of floods and poverty in this valley was not a local or a regional matter of concern only to the people who lived here. It required the best effort of the nation. And they were not afraid to direct the power and purpose of the nation towards a solution of the nation's problems. I have read much of George Norris from Nebraska and his favorite phrase recurring throughout all of his speeches was his reference and his dedication the generations yet unborn. The first of those generations is now enjoying the fruits of his labor, as will others, for decades to come. So let us all, 
whether we are public officials or private citizens, northerners or southerners, easterners or westerners, farmers or city dwellers, live up to the ideals and ideas of George Norris and resolve that we too in our time, 30 years later, will ourselves build a better nation for generations yet unborn. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good night.